The following is intended solely for the use of those with a sense of adventure. I'm shaking the dust of this town off my feet and I'm going to see the world. This is Travel with Hawkeye. Here's your host, Mark Hawkeye Lewis. I'm excited about a couple things on our podcast. Uh, first of all, at the end of the podcast, I'll be telling you about our next adventure. And you can follow our adventures on our Instagram stories, at uh, Hawkeye on Air on Instagram. Follow us there, and you can check out uh, what we're doing. And I'll tell you about that at the end of the podcast. I'm also equally excited about our guest, Mark Adams, who's written a book called Tip of the Iceberg, My 3,000-Mile Journey Around Wild Alaska, The Last Great American Frontier. And Mark... I, I saw this as soon as I saw what your book was about, and I said, I got to have this guy on the show because it is not only about a fascinating adventure that you took, but also there's a historical perspective because this adventure in Alaska also kind of replicates an adventure that took place quite some time ago by some very historic figures, correct? Very much so. Very much so. And that's what actually got me into you know, the trip to Alaska in the first place was the fact that, you know, these guys put together this trip in 1899. It's called the Harriman Expedition to Alaska. And the railroad tycoon, Edward Harriman, uh, refitted a steamship that he owned as sort of a gigantic luxury yacht, you know, perhaps the first great cruise ship to go to Alaska. And he had so much space left over that he said, hey, why don't I invite two dozen of America's top natural scientists, artists, and writers to join me for the summer as I take my family along the entire Alaska coast. Um, so people, you know, they, everybody agreed to do it. They get on board. And some of the people on board are John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club, George Bird Grinnell, founder of the Audubon Society. And, you know, these guys take off to Alaska thinking they're going to have, the, you know, your typical Alaska boondoggle, look at some beautiful nature and some scenery, and in their case, you know, make some scientific discoveries easily because a lot of Alaska was still unmapped at that time. Um, and they get up there and they realize that there's actually an environmental crisis brewing. You know, they're pouring cyanide into the water during gold mining. They're, uh, you know, farming or they're fishing out all the salmon in the rivers. You know, it's hard to think of Alaska without salmon today. But at the time, you know, the canneries were taking so much fish just to keep it away from the other canneries and letting it pile up on the shore and rot in the sun, that it, it became clear to them that a lot of these you know, keystone species in Alaska were going to be hunted and fished out within a few years. So these guys came back to Washington, D.C., where they had connections to people like Theodore Roosevelt, who a year or two after they returned, you know, suddenly unexpectedly becomes president, has got all this power. And he says, you know, look, let's start setting aside huge swaths of Alaska so that future generations can enjoy it, too. And that's why so much of the, the Alaska that we see on, say, a cruise up the Inside Passage, it's still pristine because it was all set aside by Teddy Roosevelt in 1902 and the few years after that. You know, no one would really think that in 1899 that uh, society at that time would be using resources to the point of extinction. You just you think that there's no way that could happen that long ago. Right. And that's what sparked the interest for me to go there now, because in 2015, when I first heard about the Harriman Expedition, um, it was when President Obama was up in Alaska talking about the climate change. And, you know, Alaska is very much, you know, they call it the last frontier now, but it's the first frontier for climate change. It's warming up twice as fast as the rest of the country. Um, and they're already dealing with effects that haven't really hit us yet. You know, they've got permafrost that's thawing, therefore their highways are buckling, you know, the Fabulous glaciers are melting at an unsustainable pace. You know, they're dealing with the effects of this right now. So I thought, you know, look, they came up with a solution in 1899 that worked pretty well. Maybe I should go up there now, retrace the Harriman Expedition route, and see if there's any hope for the stuff that they're facing today. And what did you discover when you retraced that route? You know, it's amazing. You know, Alaska is so vast and so beautiful. Uh, you know, you could, you could spend a year, you know, doing it mile by mile just because, you know, I mean, Alaska has the 10 tallest peaks in America are all in Alaska. Uh, you know, it's 500,000 square miles, and yet it has uh, one quarter of the miles of roads that Louisiana has, you know. So there is so much, you know, outback, so much country back there that it's easy to think, you know, this is endless, this is bottomless, this could, you know, this could never be spoiled, the same as they did back in 1899. But the truth is, um, you know, even the most, you know, climate change denying people up in Alaska realize that these effects are starting to hit now. And the problem with Alaska is that 
they're addicted to oil more so than the rest of the country. You know, they get all of their state revenue essentially from oil. Um, so on the one hand, they're feeling the effects of climate change before the rest of us do. And on the other hand, you know, they need to keep pumping oil so that they can pay for everything. And until they find a way to wean themselves from that oil money, uh, things are just going to continue to get worse and worse. Kind of interesting. Oil is like the salmon of uh, 2018 in a way. It is. It really is. And, you know, this year they opened up uh, drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which had, has been, you know, a point of contention for over 50 years. They've been wanting to, to get in there and start pumping for more oil because the oil in the north that we all know about, you know, that comes through the Alaska pipeline from Barrow, um, that is slowly running out. You know, they used to pump two million barrels a day, I think it was, and now they're down to under a million. So they're going to, you know, if they need want to keep the, the Alaska uh, economy running on oil, they're going to have to keep finding new sources. And correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, I think they still do this. I think you mentioned this in your book because my roommate in college, and this was in the 80s, he was from Alaska, and he would get a check every year, I think for like $1,000. Uh, well, that's the thing. Think, think about it. It's, it's called the permanent fund dividend. And, yes, it's, it's based on royalties from um, oil money. And it's between 1000 and $2,000 now. And every man, woman, and child gets one every year. And they don't pay any state tax. Uh, so imagine being a politician who has to, to go to the Capitol and say, well, if we're going to balance the budget this year, uh, we need to get rid of the free money that we've been giving everyone for the last 40 years. You know, that person's never going to get elected to any office again. Uh, so that, you know, that's just another hurdle that they have to get over. That's very interesting. Well, let's talk a little bit about your trek, because your trek mainly uh, was both by boat, by plane and by kayak, correct? I should yes, say yes. both, all three. Uh, but it, it mainly went around the coast. Of Alaska, starting uh, starting or ending in Bellingham, Washington. It started in Bellingham, which, you know, I, which I'm going the, to in two weeks. By the way, <laughs> it's a gorgeous little town. I love you know, that town. Bookstores and, and you know little brew pubs mm-hmm. and all that stuff. Yeah, I could I could have hung out there for a lot longer if I didn't have a boat to catch. Um, but you can you know it's it's just north of Seattle for those who don't know it, and um, you can catch the Alaska Marine Ferry there. That's where the system yes. begins. Like people will come down from Alaska, um, you know, in a small town Alaska, you can't buy a car, so a lot of people will come down to say Seattle, buy a car, put it on the Marine Ferry, and then take it back up to one of the the small towns in the Inside Passage that is not connected to the road system. There are only three towns in the Inside Passage that are connected to the road system, and two of them are at the very top, and one of them is uh, called Hyder, and it is so small, I think it's population 87, and it's buried so deep in British Columbia that they use a a Canadian uh, area code. Um, But, you know, to follow the Harriman expedition, what I did was I said, you know, I can I can actually do this using the marine ferries. It's just going to be very slow. So I went from Bellingham to Ketchikan to Juneau to Skagway, the same route that people would take on a much faster boat. Um, but if you do take the marine ferries, it's like taking Greyhound or Amtrak. You know, you can stop in every little town, uh-huh. spend a few days, get to know the people, check out the scenery on a bit more granular level rather than just doing that sort of drive-by where it's like, hey, look, there's a grizzly bear. There's an 18,000-foot mountain. Let's keep going. You know, we've only got seven days here. Um, so, you know, that that was really fulfilling to be able to stop and get to know each town on its own basis. And you met quite a few characters uh, on your trip also, and some of them that you talked about in the book, like, for instance, uh, the mayor of Nome. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Yes, Richard Beneville. Uh, Richard is actually a native New Yorker um, who was a, a Broadway performer, song and dance man. And he said he told me he essentially drank himself out of a job. He was a very uh, serious alcoholic. Unlike most serious alcoholics who, who seek help, he went to Nome, which is known for being like the hardest drinking town in America. There are bars up and down Front Street, and which is sort of the main street of Nome there. And I mean, people, they drink hard because, you know, in the winter, there's 24 hours of darkness in Nome, essentially. There's not much else to do. And it's cold. So what Richard did was he went up there, he dried himself out, and now he is he's the mayor of one of the few towns in Alaska that is actually looking to benefit from climate change. Because if you've seen the news in the last few days, um, you know, the Arctic ice is not forming like it used to, you know, just south of the North Pole. The ice in the what's called the Chukchi Sea and the Bering Strait between Siberia and Alaska. You know, in Captain Cook's journals when he came through in the 1770s, you know, he confronted a wall of 10 to 12 feet of ice that you know, went all the way from Alaska to Siberia. There was no way through. Well, starting in the 1990s, that ice has been forming later and later and at a further and further northern spot. So 
you know, Nome is going to become a shipping hub for ships going essentially over the North Pole. You know, that's going to become a major shipping lane. It's going to be a serious geopolitical issue as, as countries like the Russia, U.S., and Canada, you know, start fighting for, for the rights to that, that sea area. Um, so, you know, Nome is, is one of the few places in Alaska that, you know, is actually happy to see climate change come. Very. That's a very unusual situation that they have there. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, you ended up meeting uh, a park ranger whose grandson, or is the is the grandson of Frank Capra of It's a Wonderful Life fame. Yeah. There's a town called Yakutat at the very top of the Inside Passage, known as perhaps the most remote town in America. It's surrounded by a hundred miles of national parkland in all directions. And I went up there to talk to the, the local ranger, who was Jim Capra, and had a lovely chat about the glaciers and such. And at the end, I said, you know, um, Yakutat is a place, you know, famous for what are, what are called end of end of the rotors. The people who can't make it in the U.S. end up in Alaska. The people who can't make it in Alaska end up in Yakutat. <laughs> so I said, I, this may sound weird, but are you by any chance related to the director of It's a Wonderful Life? And he's like, yeah, that's my grandfather. I used to go out to his ranch and watch movies all the time. Um, I ended up in Yakutat because I wanted to get as far away from Hollywood as I possibly could. And looks like I've succeeded. <laughs> that is hilarious. And, you know, you spent a lot of time also on a uh, kayak exploring parts of Alaska. Yeah. Most of the kayaking I did was in Glacier Bay National Park, which is sort of a hidden gem. Um, 99% of the people who go to Glacier Bay are on cruise ships. So they're in and out in a few hours. It's spectacular. You can see the calving glaciers. You can see the the wildlife that Alaska is famous for. Um, But when we were there, we kayaked to a place called Russell Island, which was buried under glaciers 150 years ago. You couldn't go there. Um, And my guy, the guy named David, said, you know, look, we're the only people within 20 miles of here right now because the cruise ships come during the day. Um, Get up in the morning and look at the sunrise, which, of course, in Alaska is like 3.30 in early June. So I get up and I'm looking north in Glacier Bay at this enormous white glowing glacier. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And then out of the corner of my eye, I see these two sort of brown spots slowly moving toward me. And it turns out there are two Alaskan brown bears. <laughs> and I, I just about soiled myself. I was so <laughs> transfixed by the fact that, you know, they're here, here less than a football field distance away from me are these two, you know, amazing brown bears. Uh, I'm going to sit here at least for a minute or two and just have a good look at them. That's very interesting. You know, we talked a couple weeks ago uh, with a Joe uh, Wilkins who wrote a book about the gates of the Arctic National Park, uh, which sure. is so remote they don't even have any roads in there at all. And he yeah. had the, almost the exact same story you did about uh, encounters with bears, which, uh, you know, if you're going to spend some time in some of the more remote areas of the national parks, you almost have to be prepared for it. Oh, absolutely. Even if you're not in the national parks, you know, even if you're in a smaller town, you have to be ready for bears to show up at any given moment. I mean, in the summer in Alaska, I I say, you know, the news is is like, you know, news, weather, sports, maulings, (laughs) every single day, (laughs) you know, there's somebody getting their face clawed or, you know, some tourist gets a little too close and, you know, it, it invites an attack from an angry mama grizzly. Yeah, I mean, the bears are like the weather there in the summer. You know, you're going to have to deal with them at some point. That is interesting. That's interesting. You also talk about in your book about the best one-day excursion in Alaska, something that your cruise ship cannot arrange. Tell people what that is. Well, that is in Glacier Bay. That is, you go to a little town called Gustavus, which is just an absolute picture-perfect little town. It's like 1950s America. Uh, You get on what's called the Glacier Bay uh, National Park Day Boat. You take this tour up to the northern end of Glacier Bay, and you're moving slowly. You're moving much more slowly than a cruise ship would. Uh, you stop at, to, at these you know, rocky islands, look at you know, sea lions and, and puffins and things like that along the way. And then when you get to the northern end of the park, there are calving glaciers. And you can sit there and watch the face of the glacier, chunks of ice fall off, splash into the sea. You know, it sounds like a thunderbolt. Um, And then you ride back. They give you lunch. They give you all you can drink coffee. You can buy beer if you want. Um, And it is just absolutely, spectacularly gorgeous. John Muir, who, you know, was on the 1899 expedition, was famous for writing about Yosemite. He's sort of the bard of Yosemite. And even he admitted that Glacier Bay has, you know, many, many, many more times the beauty that Yosemite does. And it's true. And you can capture a lot of that in a single day. 
Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, and you also discovered a town that is Alaska's surf capital, surfing in Alaska. Exactly. That's Yakutat, where, where Jim Capra was. Uh-huh. And, you know, you can go down to the beach in Yakutat, and it's this big black beach. I mean, if, if there's any spot in the world where a beach on a sunny day can be called spooky, it would have to be Yakutat. <laughs> it's got this black sand and these, you know, sort of, you know, denuded tree trunks that have, that have washed up on the shore. And then off in the distance, you've got this 18,000-foot snowy mountain. And then beneath it, you can see surfers in, in wetsuits because the water is extremely yes. cold. But it's like, you know, it's, it's a bucket list spot for surfers. They, say, well, I, they want to say, I served Yakutat. And you can find them there. Yeah, absolutely. And I would suggest to you they're probably not even wearing wetsuits. They're probably wearing a dry suit, which is, well, uh, maybe. Which is kind of even more protecting of the water and the cold temperatures than a wetsuit would be. I would, I would probably uh, assume that would be what they would be wearing. So. Oh, you, you'd know better than I would. I mean, I, if I were going to go out there, I'd be in a submarine. No <laughs> get me into that water. Yeah, you know, the other day I saw a YouTube video of someone windsurfing out in that area, and I thought, okay, I, you know, I— I do enjoy partaking in windsurfing, and but I mean, like I, I just draw the line at like sixty degrees outside. If it's the, no. colder than that, that's ridiculous, in my opinion. And the, and the water near the coast. I mean, when we were in yes. Glacier Bay, my guide was like, "Look, it's seventy degrees. We can take our long sleeve shirts off." Uh-huh. Uh, by the way, if you fall into the water, you've got about sixty seconds to get out because it's thirty-five degrees and you're going to be hypothermic. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. There was a boatload of fishermen here for a few weeks ago, and guys fell into the water not far from shore, and I think two or three of them died because they, they just you know froze up. Yeah. Uh, so you know that water is cold, cold, cold. Yes, yes. And then before I let you go, you know uh, Alaska was you know we bought it from the Russians. Thank God we did. Now, yeah. I mean, when you think about that, just think how the world would be different if we did not buy that land uh, from oh the my Russians. God. Uh, I mean, it's, and imagine if the Russians had figured out there was gold there. They never would have sold it. Yeah. You know, the Russians sold it to us because they thought the, the, the fur seals were getting capped out, and it was super expensive for them to, you know, think about being in Russia in, in you know, St. Petersburg at the time and trying to control the entire state of Alaska with, a, you know, a tiny mm-hmm. fraction of your navy. Um, there's, you know, it, it, gold was found there just a few years after 1867 when we purchased it. You know, if they had found that beforehand, it, you know, They'd be speaking Russian up there now. Yeah, yeah, it would be a totally different world. In fact, there are you can still find some remnants, uh, cemeteries, old churches of when Russia owned Alaska. But when we bought it, it was called Seward's Folly uh, because the yep. person who uh, advocated the buying Alaska, they thought it, it. The story is that people thought it was a waste of money. But you're saying that that's yeah. a myth, actually. No, it is a myth. The Senate vote was 37 to two, even in 1867, in favor. Uh, even in 1867, it was obvious we were getting a screaming deal on this huge, you know, piece of, of land with, uh, you know, uncountable resources in it. Uh, so, you know, the idea that you know people fought against the purchase of Alaska is just a myth. How, how did though the United States recognize that this was a deal, and Russia thought that this was just a, you know something that they couldn't really you know afford? Well, I think the U.S. realized that, you know, people were pulling furs out of there. You had the whole history of the the British with the Hudson Bay Company trading with the natives up there and and bringing furs back to Canada. Um, You know, there were signs that there was going to be, you know, timber, fish, that sort of thing. Um, And remember, this is this is the 1860s. You've got the railroads being put through the, the American West. And, you know, I think 1893 is the year that they declared the, the American frontier to be gone. So the idea that we could suddenly have a new frontier to the north uh, is, was very appealing. You know, you have this whole new virgin land to, for lack of a better term, exploit. Uh, so it seemed like a great deal. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize, I just learned this a few weeks ago, the last shot of the Civil War I was actually in Alaska. I did know that. I did know that, but did not before I started researching this book. <laughs> And uh, I will. Yeah. Uh, that, that's homework for people listening us to, to listening to us now. They can go find out more. It's it's out there. It's it's an interesting story. But we're kind of out of time here. And, and Mark, I really appreciate your time. It's a fascinating book. Tip of the iceberg. Uh, your three thousand mile journey around wild Alaska, the great last American frontier, and a uh, recapturing the journey that John Muir and uh, George Bird Grinnell uh, took on uh, E. H. Harriman's expedition. And if I could just add one kind of pop culture note to uh, Mr. Harriman. Uh, if you watch Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, he's a character in that movie. <laughs> he is. He is. You can find that The Last Shot of the Civil War and the E.H. Harriman trivia online. Okay. All right. Mark, again, thank you very much, and thank you for sharing us uh, your adventures. Thanks so much, Hawkeye. A real pleasure.
Mark Adams, the author, our guest. Uh, and before I go, I did mention this, that I I, uh, I said, if you stay to the end of the podcast, I'm going to tell you what our, our next adventure is, and you can follow us on Instagram stories. And I kind of alluded to it. We'll be headed up to Bellingham, Washington, which is on Puget Sound. It's a beautiful city. It's where Mark actually started. It's where the Alaska Ferry takes off. And we're going to be headed up there for something called the Ski to Sea Relay. And what this is is a relay race held in Bellingham, Washington, where you start uh, uh, up in the mountains, and the first leg of this relay race is a skiing race at Mount Baker, then a cross-country uh, leg, and then a cycling ra- leg, a running leg, a bicycle, a mountain bike leg, a canoe leg, and then a final leg of sea kayaking. And I'll be doing the running leg on my brother's team, Darwin's Heroes. So uh, my brother is a professor at Western Washington University in Bellingham. So if you follow us on Instagram stories, our Instagram uh, account is at at Hawkeye on air. You can uh, see some of this beautiful city called Bellingham, Washington. We will share it with you. All right. Once again, thanks to Mark Adams. Tip of the iceberg is the book. You've been listening to the Travel with Hawkeye podcast. I'm Mark Hawkeye Lewis and...